Good morning, everybody. My name is Casey Dempster, and I'm your host today on Breaking the Rules. I have with me Ray Lowe as well, and, uh, but before I get, turn things over to him, I'd like to talk briefly about the name titling of our show, Breaking the Rules. And basically what we're talking about is um, that there's, there's always going to be change in your life, whether we like it or not, it's, it's just a part of, of living. And um, a lot of people resist change because it makes them uncomfortable. And so we believe that, that being able to control as much as possible of the change can make it easier for you. And sometimes that means breaking the rules. Uh, just because things have always been done a certain way doesn't mean that you have to continue doing them that way. And I have a quote today from J. Paul Getty that kind of supports that. And he says, in times of rapid change, experience could be your worst enemy. And when I quoted that to Ray, he, he was a little confused, I think, and wasn't sure where I was making the connection. But I think that sometimes in times of change, we, we fall back on what we know. And uh, we may end up doing, you know, making things not as good as they could be. If we took some time and took a step back and thought about what would fit us better um, and changed some of the rules, that the entire experience would be better for us. So, good morning, Ray. Um, Ray calls himself the luckiest guy in the world, and I want to ask him, what makes you think you're the luckiest guy in the world? Well, before I answer that, you know, your quote actually is really apropos to our guest today because he's going to talk a little bit about adapt, stealing what you want to steal from your past life and your experience and then changing the rest, okay? And uh, to answer your question, why am I the luckiest guy in the world? Well, it's, it's because I'm living the life that I love to live. And, and there are two things I think that you need to do uh, in order to, uh, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. and, and the first thing, and probably the most important one, is you have to stay engaged and you have to keep your sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, too many people just kind of run off into retirement, they think it's gonna be free form and free fall, and when you do that, you lose your sense of purpose in life, and when you do that, everything falls apart. So somewhere here, you have to bring value to people and you have to continue to bring value to people because that's what is really deep down important in life. The other thing I think that you need to do okay. is, is you need to take control of your life and redesign the life for you that you want to have. Break the rules. Break the rules. <laughs> now this, this takes a little work because you have to figure out who you are and what you want to be and then you have to take control of this. But I think when you do these two things, you bring value to other people around you, when you design your life and live it under your rules, I think all of a sudden everything comes together and you feel like the luckiest guy in the world. So let's bring on our guest. Okay. Okay, so our guest today is Phil Burtis. And Phil and I met long ago and oh so far away, and he gave me a copy of his book, uh, which I read a couple of years ago. And the uh, first thing about the book is it's called Reboot as opposed to Retire. And so, Phil, why don't you, you know, step in and make some comments about why you wrote this and what it's about. Well, I wrote the book Reboot because I had been through two failed retirements. I always thought if I could reach 60 or 65 uh, and have an early retirement, say, maybe 55, uh, have my house paid off and have my cars paid off and maybe have a boat out there, I'd be the luckiest guy in the world. Well, uh, as luck would have it, I was able to do all those things. And after about four months, I was bored to tears. And so then, uh, to, the only way I knew I was real was to say yes. When somebody, Would you do that? Yes, I'll do that. Would you be on this board? Yes, I'll do that. Would you help us with this campaign? Sure, I'll help you with that. And after about six months, my schedule was full. I was working 50 hours a week, and probably 75% of it was stuff I didn't want to do. <laughs> so everything was filled up because I had said yes, 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 because I had nothing guiding what I would do. So I went back to work, and I seriously took up uh, doing things that made sense, and, but I was bored with it. And so finally I took a second job and went back to Australia, I was part of a four-man team that privatized the largest company in Australia. And then I came home and I wrote this book, Reboot. And the whole idea of Reboot is that 
Just like when we reboot a television program or reboot a movie, uh, you take the parts that worked and you amplify them in the next version and you take the parts that didn't work and you throw them away. And one of the things we need to do, I think, is to take a hard look at our past life as we go through that transition to retirement and say, what is it that we're doing that we want to keep doing? What is it that we do that's right? But as we go into the future, the problem isn't what we know, it's, it's what we know that ain't so. And there are so many things that you know, we think are gonna happen and they really aren't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think we have to just be engaged with other people, uh, have the ethic of helping our neighbor, uh, looking at obstacles when they come along as just another opportunity to glorify whoever it is we're trying to glorify in our life and, uh, and push ahead. Now, there are two things that I remember you said to me as we just talked before, uh, where you stay engaged, yeah. okay? And I'm sure there are more than that, but let's start with these two. So, so number one is you help people who are struggling with retirement. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. What do you do? Well, the, one of the most important things I do, in, in my opinion, is I try to celebrate the lives of people who are somehow making it work one way or the other. I write a weekly column in the, uh, ca in the Annapolis Capitol Gazette, that's my hometown newspaper, and it comes out every Sunday. It's called Bonus Years, and the whole idea is to lay out what people do in their bonus years to make life interesting, to make life work. And you know, the most satisfied people are people who are not only socially engaged, but they're socially engaged in ways that are productive and satisfying. By productive, I mean they add value to somebody, to somebody else's life or to the society, and satisfying in the sense that no matter how hard the work may be, it's something that's satisfying to them. And uh, I think that, that the, the lesson I've taken from that is the most successful people, the people who we would call successful in aging, are people who have, who have found ways to engage in activities that are productive and satisfying every day of the week. Sometimes it's volunteer activity. I had a guy once who was a uh, high-level executive in a, an aluminum company. Uh, he retired, was bored to tears, and now he sacks groceries at the local pay, uh, a, a giant store. But he loves sacking groceries. I said, how can you do this after all you've done? He said, hey, I sack groceries. You should see the... The, the smiles on people's face when I say, hey, I'll put them in the trunk for you. And uh, sometimes they even give me tips. <laughs> and, uh, if they only knew this guy's net worth, they'd, yeah. <laughs> they'd get a tip from him. But he loves what he's doing mm -hmm. because for the first time in his life, he said, for the first time in my life, I have what the social scientists call personal agency. I see the direct result of the work that I do. He said, I worked for 30 years and all I did was papers and plans and architectural things and so on. I never saw how we got from A to Z. I only saw the A and the B and maybe the X and the Y and the Z and nothing in the middle. And I got to tell you, the stuff in the middle is the most interesting. That's cool. That's a great story. So when you, uh, you write this article every week, and, yeah. and I, I know what it feels like, because we do this television show, and it yeah. gives you a great chance to, to interview interesting people and yeah. then share that mm -hmm. with other people. But what's the most, who's the most interesting person you've ever interviewed for your column? Oh, wow. That would really be impossible to say because they're all interesting, and that sounds like a phony answer. But when I started doing this, I thought there would be, you know, kind of a certain type of person that I would be in. But I've interviewed rich people, poor people. I've interviewed people who've retired at 50, people who are still working at 90. I, I've, I interviewed a guy not long ago who had just turned 100, and he is the most important person in uh, one of the mega churches in the uh, Annapolis area in terms of the woodworking activities they do to keep the church uh, fully maintained. Uh, so uh, one time, I had to have an endoscopy when they put this thing down your throat. So you have to have a, a, an anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So I was lying there and the nurse is taking care of me and this elderly nurse walks by and she said, how you doing? And I said, fine. And she said, is that she taking good care of you? And I said, yeah, she's saying, she well, yeah, but she's the best nurse in this hospital. This is a huge hospital uh, in Annapolis, Maryland. And uh, 
she walked on past and she said, that's my mother. <laughs> and this woman was about 49 years old and the mother was 83. And the mother was 83 and she still worked full time in the hospital. So then I told her I wanted to do a story about her mother, so she set it up. And I went over to her mother's house. And um, when I got there, the mother was in the kitchen making cookies for a brownie meeting where she wasn't even the brownie group leader. She just helped the neighbor who huh. was the brownie group leader. Now, that's 83 years old, still working, still being active. And guess what? Her husband's sitting there with a zapper. Didn't say hello to me or anything. When, when I came in the house. Mm. And I kind of felt sorry for him and her. And, but you know, that's him, yeah. that's her. They still are together, they're loving each other, but they have two different ways. And I think her way is the way that most of us are going to want to find, uh, the path most of us are gonna to wanna to find when we, when we reboot. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's about time for our first break. So when we come back, I wanna hear about Kermit the Frog, among other things. We'll be right back. For independent living for seniors age 62 and over, People Inc. offers safe, maintenance-free apartments across Western New York. The affordable rent is income-based. For more information, call People Inc. Senior Living at 817-9090. In a world where bankers have lost all interest, where robots and fat cats rule our fortunes, one woman Hi. will stand up and strive to do the impossible. Be treated like a person. Friends and neighbors will join her quest. Ordinary people will band together against the forces of corporate greed. And together they will form Philadelphia Federal Credit Union, already in a neighborhood near you. Assurance, it's a word, a touch, a look that sparks a feeling, peace of mind, that everything will be all right. These are the moments that inspire us to do more than you'd ever expect from a car insurance company at a price that's less than you'd expect. This is more than just insurance. This is Plymouth Rock Assurance. Welcome back to Breaking the Rules. I'm your host, Ray Lowe. I'm here with my co-host, Casey Dempster, and with Phil Burgess. Uh, Phil ventured all the way up from, from Annapolis to be with us today, and he's the author of a book called Reboot. And um, you wrote this book primarily for people who were retiring or thinking about retiring, and then your son picked up the book? Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, he, he picked up the book and he started reading it, which was very flattering. Um, <clears throat> usually sons don't do anything like that. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, Dad, this is, this is as much for me as it is for you, because he was just getting out of graduate school, oh. had just finished his MBA. And, uh, and then I got to thinking about it. You know, it really is. I mean, we're really talk, talking about transitions when we talk about the these change from a life of work to a life of whatever. Now, you know, the uh, back in the 1960s when all this retirement uh, uh, fantasy started developing that we're going to retire to endless, to years of endless uh, leisure and amusement. You know, the people out in Arizona who started Sun City, they're the ones who started that mythology. But most of us grew up, grew up believing it. But something happened on the way to the funeral home, and that is we started living longer, mm -hmm. and maybe five years of endless leisure and amusement, amusement's okay, but I've met people who are now 65 years old who've just retired who are going to live as many years in retirement as they lived working, mm -hmm. and think of all the transitions that you go through when you're working. You get married, you buy a house, you have a child, you buy a new house, you lose your job, you get a new job, you move to a new city. Our life is full of transitions and we go through those transitions with our wives and with our, our children. But as we get older, we don't think about those. Well, the biggest transition in life uh, is the transition from a life of working eight hours a day to a life of retirement. And the most important thing about that transition is how do you 
how do you make a transition work? And though we have a lot of practice at us, we, we don't think about it. And the way you make a transition work, I'm convinced. I'm convinced from my experience. I'm convinced from reading the social science literature. And that is that we, we take a time out. We look at what we've been doing with our life. What is it that's satisfying and productive? What is it that isn't satisfying? We, and, and when we find what's satisfying and productive for us, we amplify that in our next life. And we throw out the stuff that doesn't work. And as we start amplifying what did work, we also find new opportunities to do new things that are productive and satisfying. But the touchstone for me is, is it productive and is it satisfying? Mm -hmm. There are many things that are productive, like cleaning out a toilet, but they may not be satisfying for a lot of people. <laughs> and there are a lot of things that are satisfying, like you know, sitting in the hammock and uh, sipping lemonade, but that's not productive. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, the test for me is to find something that's productive and satisfying. And when we do that, we should do as much of it as we can because it's doing that that we fulfill our purpose as human beings. We live out our purpose. You know, God gave us certain gifts and some of those gifts were we, we uh, add to and some of those gifts uh, uh, get uh, better and better as we go on. There's no place in any book I've ever read where it says, when you're 65, throw away your gifts. No, we're called to use our gifts to the very end and to use them to help others and repair the world. And if we do that, we'll be satisfied. That's, cool. That's great. So when, when you help people, when you're having somebody who's struggling with a transition, and I'm going to use that word instead of retirement, right. although often it's retirement, right? Uh, how do you help them find uh, their mission in here because it may not be the same mission that they had when they were engaged in work or in something right. else. Yeah. Uh, are there questions you ask? What do you do? Yeah. Actually, uh, I struggle with that a lot. I mean, one of the things that I have uh, uh, encouraged people to do is to write their autobiography because I think that one of the most uh, rewarding experiences I had in my life was when I came home one night uh, I was traveling, back, uh, being gone for the week, and my uncle, and I received in the mail the autobiography of my uncle, who had been a B-24 pilot, bomber pilot in World War II in mm. Europe. And that autobiography was sitting there in a package. It was before FedEx. I ripped it open. It was 1 o'clock in the morning when I got in, and I finished it at 7 o'clock in the morning. Wow. I was engrossed in it. It wasn't very well written. But I learned things, that, I'm getting chills down my back now thinking about it. <laughs> okay. I, I, I learned things about my uncle, my uncle and aunt, and how they struggled to be together. They were in to get married when he was at a fort someplace in Texas, and mm -hmm. what happened when his plane crashed one day, and all these things. And I just thought, what a richness that is. And I've talked to him about it many times before he died, and he said it was one of the most rewarding experiences of his life in helping him to reorient the last 15 or 20 years that he lived after that. Hmm. So I think that's a useful thing to do. I don't mean to plug you because uh, I'm on your program today, but one of the things that people do is they, they say, well, who am I gonna be talking to tomorrow? What kind of things does he, does he do? And I got on your website and I picked up these, uh, these uh, worksheets, the luckiest guy in the world worksheets, evaluating your life. What's working? What isn't working? I got to tell you, Ray, this is some of the best stuff I've seen in terms of tools to use to get to where you want to be. You have to put yourself through the discipline of self-examination. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And how few times do we take the time to examine our lives? Well, I think, quote, retirement, that big transition, that's the time to sit back and re-examine our lives and say, what are we doing and where do we want to go? And sometimes it's don't wait till retirement. Try to do a lot of that beforehand yeah. so, that, so that you have a really rock solid plan for what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I mean, the best of us will be doing it every five years, True. but we don't do that. Right. But I think one of the things that happens at retirement is we, we feel a little bit lost in a sea and it's not a sea of uh, threat. It's a sea of opportunity. And uh, Eric Fromm, I think, wrote the book um, uh, Escape from Freedom. Hmm. And, you know, one of the 
most paralyzing things that can happen to us is to have a lot of freedom. And one of the ways we, and that's one of the things we have when we retire, total freedom, that's the time to sit down and discipline ourselves. Yeah, because total freedom is nothingness. You know, uh, we, uh, I go back to my parents all the time, and one day they were fully engaged, the next day they were 65, they had absolutely no structure in their life. Yeah. And I know one of the things that you do is you try and make sure that you have some structure in your life every day. Yeah, you? right. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to, you know, get up at a certain time, to have a routine every day. I have a, this column I write, it's like a cookie monster that has to be fed every week. And uh, that really brings a lot of structure to my life. I mean, mostly on Sunday, I don't know who I'm going to be writing about, and the copy is due on Wednesday at noon. And so I'm always looking. It, it, one of the interesting things about writing a column is you're always looking for interesting people. I mean, I was in a cab one night, and I started an Uber cab, and I started talking to the driver, and, she's in, and my wife was in the backseat. I, I said, how did you get, uh, get into this? She said, well... You want to know the truth? She said, my husband retired. And all he does is sit around the house. And I said, honey, you got to get active. And, and so then he starts rearranging the house. She said, you know, I've been running that house really well for 40 years. And he says, the, the, the knives and forks ought to be here. And the plates ought to be in this one and not in this one. And I decided for the sake of our marriage, I had to get out of the house. So I started driving this Uber. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the old saying, I... I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> and uh, so she got out for yeah. lunch and she drove the Uber. Yeah, my mother told my father after he rearranged her kitchen yeah. that uh, he needed to uh, get out. And so he started volunteering for some yeah. um, volunteer positions. Like he was, he was uh, this was a long, long time ago, uh -huh. but with the environmental protection in New Jersey, yeah. things like that, yeah. so yeah. They can still use that. Oh yeah. <laughs> you have on your website a uh, notation about Kermit the Frog. Uh-huh. Okay, uh, tell us about Kermit the Frog. Well, the Kermit the Frog story is that uh, I, one of the weeks when I was looking for people to write about, uh, I ended up uh, writing about a person who was contemplating having a lot of, shall we say, work done on her face. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and she was very open about it and didn't know whether she really wanted to do it or not. And I, I, I wrote about what are the pros and cons and all this. And, you know, there's something about kind of accepting who you are. And I, I found this from, I remember from Kermit the Frog when I was a little kid, he had this song called I'm a Greenie. And the first verse says, I'm a greenie. It's terrible being a greenie. It's horrible. Why can't I be red or yellow or purple or some other pretty color? And I'm green and people don't see me. They step on me. And then the second verse says, but you know, it's not so bad being green. Everything is green. Everything God made is green. Green's a beautiful color. Besides, I'm green and I should be green. What's wrong with being green? Yeah. And, you know, I think in the end, you know, what's wrong with being old? You know, you get old, that's a natural thing. Should we try to hide our gray hair or try to hide our bald heads or try to, you know, get our faces to look like that? No, let's, we're green. Mm -hmm. And that's, and there's, it's okay to be green mm -hmm. and make the most of being green. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Kermit the Frog had it right. And we, we need more Kermit uh, uh, ideology around rather than uh, some of the others we have. Okay, so with people looking at retirement, we're going to have to close up here, but uh, what are the two or three key points that you want to tell them that they need to do? Well, number, number one is, is uh, stay so socially engaged, and if you're not, become socially engaged through volunteer work, through a senior center, through any place that's going to bring you in contact with other people. Number two, keep learning. You have, if you're at 60 or 65 years old, you've got a wealth of experience and knowledge. And wisdom is the combination of experience and knowledge. And, and so it seems to me you, should need, you need to uh, understand what your great asset is and find ways to use it with younger people or with, uh, uh, with uh, organizations that, that need the kind of help that you could give them. So I think finding places to be engaged, volunteering uh, in community organizations, helping your neighbor, that's what we're called to do. I don't care what 
our religious background is, every religion says, help your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that if you engage in that, that's going to go a long way to having a successful experience. You know, I think I got to give up my title of the luckiest guy in the world, Phil. I think you're it, okay? <laughs> and thank you so much for being with us on our show, Breaking the Rules, today. And KC, what's coming up in the future? Right. Next week, we have a great guest. Her name's Francine Block, and she has been helping kids get into the right college for them for quite a long time. So uh, tune in next week at 10 o'clock for Breaking the Rules on Tuesday. Visit us at PlymouthRock.com.